as you can guess, it's Deborah Wella. I had the community outreach section within uh, DOAE Sustainable Initiative Division. I'm here with Carol Baugh, who uh, is part of the what we call the COPE team. And we're going to talk to you about today rain gardens. How many of you were at the workshop last week? No, last month. Last month. It feels like last week. <laughs> no, actually, I did one last week, which was for contractors. So sorry about that. Okay, so how many of you actually have rain gardens? How many of you want to have a rain garden? Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, then many of you already probably know what a rain garden is. And what makes a rain garden different from a regular garden is how that water gets to it and what happens to the water once it's there. Because basically, a rain garden is designed so that the stormwater runoff goes into the garden and has enough time to soak into the ground. It typically, you want it to stay there for about 24 to 36 hours, maybe 48, not any longer. You don't want more than maybe six, seven, eight inches. It depends on the design. Carol's going to be talking about that in her presentation. It comes in and it soaks in. It ba basically mimics meadows and forests. Because the problem we have right now, oh, there we go is that we have so much impervious <coughs> cover that we have polluted stormwater runoff coming off. And polluted stormwater runoff is the number one source of water pollution in urban areas. And you heard me say this last week, it doesn't matter whether you're in Greenbelt, in Chicago, or uh, Peoria, Illinois. We have paved over so much of our natural area that when it rains or the snow melts, it goes across the landscape, the pavement, the sidewalks, even lawns, and picks up whatever's there, and it carries it either directly or indirectly to our streams. And yes, we're we'll worried about the Chesapeake Bay, but I'm going to say to our local streams, because that has an impact on us. It affects our recreational ability. It impacts our aesthetics. It can even increase what you're paying for clean water. Because my guess is everybody here gets their water from WSSC. The dirtier that water is, the more it's going to cost to get it cleaned up. And you can make a bet it's not WSSC taking that cost. Who's it going to be passed on to? Us. So what we want to do is everything we can to keep that water clean. But rain gardens have other benefits beyond just the storm water. Yes, it, re it keeps the water clean, but it can also help you if you have a ponding or erosion area. You have that wet spot. It gets wet, then it flows into your neighbor's yard, and then it becomes polluted storm water. That was an example that was just kind of mentioned to me when somebody has a seepage, you know. Well, if you can keep that water on your property, keep it from getting dirty, that's great. Use that rain guard, and it'll help you with solving a problem. Reduces bacteria. Recharge of natural groundwater. That's something most of us don't think of. But the more we put that impervious cover on, less water going in. What keeps our streams flowing during the summer? Groundwater. That's why many streams that people remember used to flow in the middle of the summer, don't flow anymore because there's no groundwater to recharge it. It all flows off in that really flashy, massive amount. Another one that is good for your wallet, it can, if you install a rain garden, <coughs> you can apply to get a reduction in your clean water fee. And I'm smiling because I'm in video tape, but I'm going to say, this is what people think of as the rain tax. It is not a tax on the rain. It is a fee on the amount of polluted stormwater coming off your property. If you put a rain garden or any of the practices that are uh, described in the other room, you can apply for a reduction in your clean water fee. 
And the benefit beyond that, rain gardens are beautiful. They attract uh, wildlife. Uh, the Baltimore checker spot, endangered. Hummingbird, bluebird. Bluebird used to be numerous. They're getting rarer and rarer. All these things are beautiful. You need to think about whether your yard, yard has the space and it's suitable for a rain garden. Many people <coughs> in Georgia County, particularly inside the Beltway, have very small yards. And it's very important to place that rain garden at least 10 feet away from the house, either your house or your neighbor's. Why? You don't want the water going in and going back to your foundation. Concrete might solve one problem and create another. Make sure you call Miss Utility and do that at the planning stage. You know, even if you don't plan for a whole year, call Miss Utility and have it come out twice and mark those spots. But do it in the planning stage. It's horrible. You do all this wonderful planning, you call Miss Utility and she goes, you can't do it there. And then, you know. You don't want to plant it under a large tree because of the root. You also want to think about where are the drip line from the tree? Where are that <coughs> canopy line? Look for natural areas that are low lying where it pines. If you want to do a rain garden, then have we got the program for you. Rain check rebate will give property owners rebates for installing rain check rebate approved practices of which the rain garden is one. In addition, we have seven other pra or six other practices, which include the urban tree canopy, rain barrel, cistern, permeable pavement, green roof, and pavement removal. Of these, the ones you would probably typically do might be a rain barrel, because the rain barrel would catch the roof runoff, and you would direct it to a rain garden. So the two pair up very nicely. If you have the space, if it fits your landscaping. Remember, all of this has to fit. It's got to be kind of an ecological fit, holistic. Each rebate gets a different amount. Rain gardens are $10 per square foot with a minimum of 100 square feet. So that's like a 10 by 10 garden. But you don't have to do it in a square. You can do it in any shape. If you apply for rain check rebate, residential is $4,000 maximum per property and $20,000 maximum per property. That is not per project. That's a lifetime maximum. So you could do a combination of rain gardens and trees, and if you hit that $4,000, that's it. To be eligible, you have to be a property owner in Prince George's County. You have to own the property. But it is open to all property owners, homeowners, members of housing co-op. If you are a member of a housing co-op, all you have to do is get a letter from the co-op saying it's OK. Many HOAs have to do the same thing because they have covenants. And if it's OK with the HOA, you get a letter from them saying it's OK. We do not supersede a covenant or anything like that. You have to be in line with your local ordinances, rules, et cetera. Nonprofits have two options. They can enter into a contract with homeowners and the Department of Environment to apply residential pra or apply practices on residential properties. The nonprofit pays the upfront cost for those practices. We did this in order to give uh, homeowners who might not otherwise be able to afford to apply an opportunity to apply. And under certain circumstances, the nonprofit can actually get the cost of construction upfront. They have to apply for that and to, they have to be vetted. Nonprofit can also apply to do practices on public or common ground for the public or common good. This is important because if you notice on this list, you don't see municipalities. You don't see local government. 
The way local governments can do it is partner with a nonprofit. Project eligibility, got to be in the county. If How many people live in Bowie proper here? No, no, no. no, but I'm asking how many, people, how many people live in Bowie here? Okay. Regretfully, if you live in Bowie, the actual city of Bowie, you are not eligible for the rain check rebate uh, because the city of Bowie has its own MPDS permit. Okay? Also, if you live in Chevrolet or University Park, you're not eligible for the tree planting component, but you're eligible for all the other practices. Why? Because both of those uh, municipalities, communities, have their own tree planting program. It's been a lot, theirs have been around longer than ours, and they may be a little bit better than ours, but they're very good. They've been around long and they're doing a great job. We just don't let them double dip is the idea. <laughs> you cannot use any of the rain check rebate practices to meet a permit requirement. In other words, if you're bought, building a new house, we got stormwater regulation and you have to meet those and you can't use these practices to meet regulation. If you're required to do it, you got to do it. This is more to address places that have been built with minimum or limited stormwater. It's a way for us to help with retrofitting. Because 81% of the county was built before we had good stormwater regulations. What you do is you apply for this through the Chesapeake Bay Trust who administers the grant for or the program for us. They will conduct a pre and post inspection for everything but rain bills. So for the rain garden, you need to fill out the application. If you've never done a, uh, if you've never done a rain check rebate before, you'll have to new, do a new applicant application where we just get information. We'll need an ownership application. We want to make sure that you really own the property. I have some examples of those applications right up here that have been filled out. So you can kind of see what a filled out <coughs> approved application looks like. What you do is you fill it in, you submit it to CBT online, they will arrange a pre-inspection, they'll come out. They are not coming out to give you engineering advice or things like that. They're coming out to see whether your application matches what's going on and whether it makes sense. But they're not there to do the engineering component. I want to emphasize that because uh, Hannah Martin, who's a uh, CBT person, told me that she'd been going out and people have been asking all sorts of questions about putting in under drains and building pervious uh, pavers. And she's standing there going, I don't know anything about that. You have to talk to your engineer. And they've gotten a little bit upset, not angry, but you know, they have been hoping for advice. Or a contractor, not, <laughs> not necessarily an engineer. Because most of these are, are not of the nature that you need a full blown engineer. But you <laughs> need a professional right. Engineer for some of them, for the previous pavement, you do need some engineering. That's the one she got hit on, the one she was a little bit baffled. You need to install the practice within 12 months of approval. You schedule your post inspection and you submit your receipts to CBT. Please make copies of your receipts. I, I say this every time, many of you heard me say it last time. How many times have you gotten a receipt from Lowe's or Home Depot and you go in to look at it and the ink's faded? You can't read it. If we, you can't read it, we can't read it, and we can't give you your rebate. So make a copy so you have a readable copy, okay? And when you turn it into us, make sure you still have a copy. It's not that we're going to lose it, but it's always good to have a copy of all your paperwork. Basically, Carol's going to be talking about what a rain gun looks like. Again, I just want to emphasize 10 square feet, or $10 per uh, square foot, 100 square foot minimum. A rain garden must treat runoff from an impervious area. 
Well, in this case, we also consider lawns impervious. Because go out and look at your lawn, and you think it's going to soak in, and it's just ponding and running off. It's not a natural situation. Because in a forest or meadow, most of the water soaks in, and what comes off is clean. Most of what comes off your lawn runs off and isn't clean. With a rain garden, we're trying to mimic. And I'm going to mention the three S's, and so will Carol. Everybody knows the three R's, reduce, recycle, and reuse. Well, they're the three S's. Slow it down, spread it out, and soak it in. And that's what we want to do with storm water. I don't think this is going to be a problem in this area. It would be in my neighborhood. You want it 25 feet away from a septic or a wellhead. You can't impede a neighbor's flow onto your neighbor's property. In other words, you can't do something that block, you put the rain gun on and then it blocks up and goes into his yard or impedes the flow so it's ponding now in his yard. You got to do it so the, the natural flow continues. And we only allow native plants. Just a quick question, is that for new plantings only? I mean, if you've got an existing space, say a previous owner put in non-natives, are you going to be required to rip those out to put in native plants if it's in that settlement zone? You know, that's a question that you would have to check with Paul to see so. That, yeah, that's a question that is, I don't know the answer no. to. Um, can you probably, write that down and we'll, yeah. we'll check with Paul and just uh, send out a generic answer. I, but I, I would venture to say that it would be a case-by-case -case decision because in the first place, if you're applying for a rebate, then you must be doing something, right. right? You're not just saying, oh, I already have this rain garden, give me money. You didn't pay any money for it, you know. Right. We, right. This is not a program by which you make money, it's a rebate. Right. So anything you didn't spend, you don't get back. Um, but if uh, you're doing some work, <clears throat> you're expanding it, say, or you're rejuvenating it, um, then that would probably be a case-by-case -case determination. And it would probably also be a function of what kind of non-native are in there. There yeah. are some non-native that the state of Maryland doesn't even want around anymore. Porcelain berries, things like that. And if they were in there or something, yeah. English ivy, they, we'd be asking you to take it out. Okay, there are certain questions you should ask when you choose a contractor. You know, you want to know how much experience do they have in installing a rain garden. And I should back up a little. Most of the time, you can do your rain garden yourself. But there are times when you might need someone to excavate, or maybe you're doing a bigger one, or maybe you just, you know, don't want to do it. You want the rain garden, but you just want somebody else to put it in. But you want to make sure they have experience. You want to get those descriptions of the practices, of what they've done. I mean, I could go to your house and talk a good, a good talk, and you'd think that I'm the best person for the job. I know everything. But then when it comes time to actually doing the design and getting the slope right, you know, I've done stuff in my home, but I wouldn't be the right person. You know, you want someone who's done it, knows how to use the equipment, have experience, get the references. In general, you want to make sure they're insured, bonded, certified, and trained. Ask them uh, to explain what services are included. You know, don't take anything by surprise. Have them write it out. Give them, have them give you an estimate. Also, ask before they come out, are they going to charge you to get this estimate? Because if they're going to, you know, some people come out and give you an estimate for free. And some say, it's going to cost you $100 for me just to look at the house. Check beforehand. You know, and ask about heavy equipment. And after the last one, we were supposed to send out a list of contractors. We will do it after this one to everybody that went to the first uh, workshop and to this workshop. And we'll do it again after the third one. So just make sure everybody gets it. And that's basically, uh, I'm open to questions. Carol's going to go into more detail on the components of the rain garden and things like that. I don't know if this would be Carol or you, but um, in our, in our, on our property, we get rain.
So we want to get a little bit more into the details of rain gardening. Let's make it a verb. Um, let me stop though and say I'm, I'm told that in uh, the, it's the, the town newspaper that you were referring the to. The news review. The news yeah, review. Yeah. Thank you. I couldn't remember the name. Um, they listed the workshop time here as 10 to 12. We actually have planned for 10 to 2, which is why the snacks are so very important. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that is um, because we really want you to get out there in the real world. I've taught classes to landscape ar architects and engineers, and every dang time, you know, I show them a slew of pictures, I say, it's not a pond, it's a rain garden, it's dry except after a rain, and it isn't until we go out in the field and stand in it that they go, it's not a pond. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, if that, um, you know, a lot of us learn best by experience, and if it's true for the professionals, it's true for the rest of us. So that's uh, what we have planned for today. All right, so where do you place your rain garden? Well, first, where does the rain go in your property? Uh, that was the subject of our first workshop, which was how to conduct a stormwater audit. Now, I know this is painfully obvious, but again, you would be surprised even, you know, by some engineers who kind of think, well, you know, we pump it uphill over here and we do whatever. Um, no, you know, all of this is about working with nature and mimicking nature to the best extent that we can. Now, you may have, we talked about, I know you can't see this, um, but I'm just reminding you from the packet from last time, that as you walk your property and you look at where the rain goes, you can also be looking at what issues you have. You know, do you have run on from another property, as several of you mentioned? Do you have erosion? Um, you know, what's going on? And as you look at these problems, but we hope that these techniques, not just rain gardens alone, but all of these cool, simple retrofits that you can do, like rain gardens and rain barrels, will be turning those problems into opportunities um, so that you really end up with improvements. So again, looking at the components of a rain garden, you have to have a way for the water to come into the rain garden. Again, I know, you're like, well, duh, Carol. Yeah. I've seen rain gardens where the rain could not get into the garden. Okay? I've seen pretty much every stupid thing that could be done, done. Up to and including uh, a construction site where they thought, oh, this rain garden looks like the best place to wash out the cement mixer. <laughs> okay? So we're going to go over some obvious ground just in case. You need a ponding area. It has to have an area to hold the water. Now, you know, the slide that Debbie showed you said six to nine inches, and that's usually for a more engineered, heavy duty, what we call a bioretention. For most of us in rain check rebate, we're talking like three inches, you know, three to six. So it's not necessarily a huge construction project. You have to have a, a way for excess water to get out. So we all were reminded, was it just last week, we sometimes get really, really big storms. And so there will be times where you will get more water than your rain garden can hold. And so you have to have, uh, you know, be prepared for that. And of course, you have the soil, the mulch, and the plants. Now, you can use ground cover instead of mulch, but you need to have a really good ground cover that's present at all times, because that top layer is actually very important in filtering out the pollutants. Uh, when we talk about putting all of these together, then you also want to think about not just how do I have all these components, but where do they fit on my property? Okay, now I said which way does the water go? Well, you can cause yourself some problems if you do what we call an inline rain garden, which means if the flow of water is like this table and 
I'm the rain garden. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get the full force of that water. Um, it's much easier if I do what we call an offline. I'm at a little angle and I can get some of the water coming towards me, but not concentrated. The more concentrated your inflow is, the more difficult it will be to keep it from scouring out. Okay, now there are a lot of problems with this rain garden. Um, I did the plant list for this, and then I came out and saw it in the field, and I was like, <laughs> they put it in the wrong place. Okay, they planted the trees right in front, right in the middle of the swale. Does everybody know what a swale is? It's, it's like a ditch without pretensions. It's just a much gentler, <laughs> shallower ditch. You know, just barely sloped enough to let the water come. So these poor little trees that hadn't had a chance to root, big storm came, uprooted them, dumped a whole bunch of sediment. Why did it dump a bunch of sediment? Because all of this upstream was torn up and didn't have vegetative cover, didn't even have lawn. So everything just came along. Now, you could also get in trouble if you put your tree right in the middle of the swale and your tree is well rooted because what's gonna happen? Right? It's like a rock in the middle of the stream. The water's going to come around it. So I'm going to show you some swale gardens, but you'll, you'll look at them and note that we don't put large woody plants right in the path of the water. Okay. Now you can do inline rain gardens. This is actually one that used to be in Colmar Manor. But because it took so much water, and because it was right in line with that water, they put all this large rock in to, to slow down and break up the flow. Because remember, we're doing the slow it down, spread it out, soak it in. Remember, it's our little dance. We make all the kids say it together when we do events. So my point is not that you can't do it. My point is, if you're gonna do it, you're going up into a kind of a higher level and you're starting to approach engineering as opposed to landscaping. And sort of my job is to make it easy for you. Okay, where to place your rain garden? What's wrong with this rain garden? Yeah, okay, it's very hard to show slopes in pictures, but this is a nice steep slope. This rain garden is just hanging on the side, um, there's, no, there's no cupped hand, there's no bowl to catch the water in the first place. Um, it's not terraced. And then the homeowner, bless their hearts, had no idea why this thing was in the front of their yard. So they went and put edging around it. So now we are guaranteed there's no water going into that garden. This is a rain-free garden. Okay, so where are some of the places that you can put it? We're gonna go over each of these. I've, I've talked about swales a bit, so let's go on. Does this look like a lovely natural area, those of you who can see it? I apologize. We're just so thrilled that so many people wanted to come, but so many people wanted to come. <laughs> so, you know, we're all packed in. But you see this lovely meandering of all these plants and it just looks gorgeous and natural. This is actually a swale running between condominiums. You know, how lovely is that? But again, you see they have a path for the water. The water can infiltrate into these areas and even spill a little bit out during the heavy rains. It's like mimicking a floodplain. Uh, here again, now when we go to Mary Lou's, you'll see something simpler in the sense of a dry stream bed approach. So these can actually be very lovely landscape features. And I know we have a lot of swales here. I don't know though whose property they're on. So, you know, I don't know if it's on the city side or your side. You have to figure that out. Here again, just a close-up. 
So I like to talk about the swale gardens because most people don't think about this. Okay, your basic simplest one is just a low spot. Now remember, we need a way for the excess water to still get out. Um, if you have a place where the water can't naturally overflow, you may have to add a drain. Um, you want it to be a low spot, but you don't want it to be a spot that holds water all the time. Why? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, yeah. If you get past the, the three days worth of holding water, that's what it takes for the mosquito eggs to hatch. And if you're doing that, what you really want to build is a bog or a wetland so you have all the critters to keep the mosquitoes in check. Um, but the rain garden is supposed to drain. Now, you might still do it in a low spot that holds water, but you might have to either amend the soils, put some sand, some compost in. You might have to uh, put a drain in. Okay, downspout. You know, it's a great thing to take your downspout directly to the rain garden, or as Debbie said, you can hook in your rain barrel also. Now, you can do this a lot of different ways. This is very simple, just connecting you know, um, an extension from your downspout. Again, you want to be careful. Maybe put some rocks where it enters the rain garden so it doesn't dig out in the heavy flow. This is also a roof downspout, but you don't see it because it comes here and then comes up from underground and little, little kind of a bubbler thing. So again, you don't have too much going on. You can also carry it via a, a drain. You can even buy super fancy pretty drains. Okay, um, driveways, right? You can take the runoff from your driveway. Now in this case, we're actually showing a rain garden that also takes some runoff from the road. But because they did every property along this road, they're not, it's not like one person's getting all that runoff. This is an interesting design I want to point out to you here. You see these little areas of grass out to the front of the rain gardens? Well, when I teach lawn care clinics, I always tell people not to have these itsy bitsy pieces of grass because they're very hard to mow efficiently. And you know, if, if your grass area is like half the size of this table, then you're kind of like you can't even use a push wheel mower. You've got to get up the weed whacker um, and you know. It's a mess, it's a big pain. In this case, they did it because they wanted the residents to feel ownership of these gardens. And they figured people would come out and maintain the lawn because they were used to lawns. And on their way to maintaining the lawn, they would pass through the rain garden and kind of clean that up too. So sometimes we need that little strip of lawn for our security blanket. <laughs> Here's another example and you can see here how the runoff is coming, but also notice how they have these little kind of check dams so that the water, as it goes through the swale, doesn't pick up too much speed, right? We don't want it to be like your hose when you wash the car and you have it on that setting where it comes out, right? Concentration doesn't help. Now, there's also something called a planter box rain garden. Now remember, if you're going to get your rebate, what's your minimum size? 100 square feet, yeah. So you would have to do a bunch of these to get 100 square feet. But if you wanted to do that and you had the right property, we would accept that. Right, I wanted, she just pointed out something I didn't emphasize. That 100 square feet, as she said, it's cumulative. So you could have 50 square feet, 25 square feet, and 25 scattered throughout your yard cumulative 100 square feet. Which is great news for folks here in Greenbelt because many of you have small yards. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to get that clear with our rain uh, garden coordinator before we came. You're, we have a lot of small yards that are right next to each other with drainage together. Can it be cumulative between several, several yards? Uh, we would have to ask our coordinator about that. Um, that's, I don't think anybody's come to us with that before, so we'll have to figure that out, but that's an interesting question. That last slide, it was 
very close to the building. I thought it had to be that's really what, feet away. That's my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> I planted her in the audience. <laughs> okay, so you're all saying, but Debbie told us it has to be 10 feet away from the house. What are you doing? That's too close. Well, like many rules in life, there are <laughs> exceptions. But if you're going to do a planter box that is close to the building, you have to do several things. It has to have a barrier between the box and the building. There's a, a park uh, over in Bethesda where they had one of those little community meeting rooms. And they put, not for a rain garden, they just thought it was cool, they put a planter box on it and they didn't put any barrier <coughs> and then they directed the downspout into it. So guess what, it rotted out the wall. So you have to have the proper um, barrier around it and you also have to have, again, remember we need a place for the excess water to go. And in this case, we don't want to infiltrate water right down to our foundation. So that means we need our planter box to go somewhere else. So here's one in Alexandria. Here's where the downspout comes in. And it's hard to see, but there's a, a drain here. Uh -huh. So what it's going to do is it's going to flow through the soil, and then it's going to tie into the storm drain. So we get some cleansing. We get some slowing of the flow, particularly if you have a bunch of these on a, on a building, but it doesn't, um, you know, doesn't back up. And what I'm going to say here is that through rain check rebate, um, I'm not sure how these would be considered, but remember I mentioned the clean water fee? These would qualify as a stormwater practice that could get you a reduction in your clean water fee. Yeah, and it I, well, doesn't have to be one of the seven. Yeah, I did check with Paul, and, and we do accept planter boxes. Okay, but in in this case, like going back to what Ben said, each unit of this condominium has one of these. Um, I have a question about that slide. We just it, it has this, the rain spout. Um, yeah. Be one more slide, and you can see the drain is right under the rain spout. So I don't see how this. Water would have a chance to because this, yeah, it, it's, it it's the problem of the picture because picture flattens things. Okay. This drain is actually raised. Oh, so okay. here's the level of the, the okay. soil and the drain is actually up. You okay. just can't see it from this angle because this was the best angle I could get without actually climbing into the planter box. <laughs> uh, so it only goes into the drain once the water has filled up. You'll see this. Um, I think when we go outside, you'll see a similar setup where you'll see um, raised drains. And you might have wondered why they're sitting up like that. That's why. See, here's a, another example of a planter box. And we even can do this in uh, a street where you can funnel some of the water in. Now, what if you do have a slope? Well, you can do something called a slope weed garden where you kind of have like a terrace thing. And in this case, you're letting the water fill in and then slowly trickle and fill in and slowly trickle. How is it trickling? You have openings. Now, you can't really see it from here, but yeah. Um, here's another example where it's, it's a little more obvious. This is a more... You know, this is an apartment building, so again, it's more constructed. Um, again, this is where it becomes critical to understand how much flow you've got, right? Because you need to know that it can handle what's coming and whether or not you need a drain at the bottom and those kinds of things. So, you know, figuring that out is actually not super hard. I am really, really lame at math. I mean, you know, whenever numbers come up, you'll see me look at Debbie for <laughs> math girl, save me. Um, but, you know, it is something uh, that, that you can do, and it's in your guidelines, actually, that are in your packet. We also have in your packet a nice handout from Extension on how to measure your yard, because, you know, some of us didn't do that well in geometry. But how big should your garden be? 
Well, the general rule of thumb is 20 to 30 percent of the impervious cover that you are that's draining to the garden. Because remember, you have to be treating some impervious cover with your rain garden or we're not giving you a rebate. If it's just a happy rain garden sitting by itself, but it's not treating anything, right? This is all about slowing that stormwater down. So it has to be stormwater coming from something. You, you stay on the low side if you have really good draining soil, like sandy soil. You stay on the higher side if your soil doesn't drain as quickly. You can do a test hole. You can figure that out. Now, part of that, as I said, is you want to not send too much to one rain garden. You know, I would have been very excited to speak to 120 people today, but where would I have put them? Mm -hmm. Right? It's the same issue. In general, unless they're heavily engineered, a rain garden should get only a half acre or less of drainage. If you have a larger drainage area, then you want to subdivide it. If you have the very small yard, you know, maybe you're just setting one downspout, right? Or maybe you want a rain barrel and a rain garden so that you have enough capacity. So those are very important because you don't want it to be <laughs> blown out. Because mm -hmm. this is how it feels when your beautiful little rain garden gets carried away by a storm. You get very unhappy. I know I did. All right, let's talk a little bit about design. At our third and upcoming workshop, we're going to focus more specifically on how to do designs. And we're also going to focus on how you actually apply. We're going to have Hannah Martin here from the Bay Trust. Um, I believe we're also going to have uh, Eco Oasis Nursery here with a display their stuff and will help you work on your specific gardens. But I want to give you an overview today before we go out and see so you have a little more background. I recommend tying visually your rain garden into the rest of your landscape so that it kind of, you don't necessarily even know it's a rain garden until you walk up on it. So like here we see this, you pull back it's all kind of landscaping. So why do I say that? What's wrong with this picture? Anything? There's really nothing wrong with this. It's perfectly fine to have your rain garden be your one landscape statement. The only problem is, is if you're not a gardener and you're new to planning things, and you've never done a rain garden on top of that. Do you want this to be like the one thing front and center in your yard while you're, you know, these are, they all, even they take a little bit of adjustment. You know, you get some experience, you tinker. Um, you know, Mary Lou will tell us about that when we see her yard. You know, we were talking about it is, it's a process, it's, it's a verb. <laughs> it's not really something static. So, you know, if, if you've got the wherewithal to do this, fine. But for most of us, I think it's easier if we blend it in. Uh, there's also the question of what are your neighbors like? Um, is your garden going to be an issue? This is a garden I did for a school. It got cut down. <laughs> All right? It got cut down because the plants were tall and because it attracted dragonflies and the kids and the teachers were scared of those big bugs. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> they eat mosquitoes, they're beautiful, you know, they're, what would you not like? But they didn't know what they were. So, you know, you want to think a little bit about your context to have a successful rain garden. Now, Greenbelt, you have your history, it's a very cool place, it's probably not so much an issue for you here. But in a lot of communities, it really is. There's a, a designer, Colston Burrell, my favorite story of his is he put a prairie, big, tall, little, but big, tall plants in his front yard. The neighbors hated it. They reviled him. 
Then he got one of those little fake fences where it's just the corner and it's like a white timber fence and he put that on the corner of the yard where the prairie garden was. That garden made the cover of Southern Living Magazine <laughs> and now everybody loves it. So it's context, right? Now here's some good examples of rain gardens that just look like gardens. You know, it isn't until you walk on the little steps here that you realize there's a depression, right? We look, we see the drain here. If I just show you this, it looks like a swale garden. But when I pull back, you see it's integrated into the whole hillside of that house. So here again, if maybe you have a little problem, you didn't quite pick the right plant there, you could replace it, but the whole yard doesn't look like, what's that, what's that hole in the middle of my yard? <laughs> right? Here again, we have other features that if we look at them closely, we can see that the water is being directed. There's a little check down in there. But it really just looks like a garden. Okay. But, you know, you may not have the ability to do this again with a small yard. So, it's always good to signal the intentionality, right? This isn't something I, I just, you know, I've mowed everywhere but here, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, a big honking sign is one way to do that. <laughs> and we're happy with that if, if you make it a rain check rebate sign, because then that's advertising and we would love that. Um, but what else can you do? Uh, back to that example from Colston Burrell, you can frame the complexity of your design with a, a fence or a mowed path, or here you see, you know, a really architectural hard edging. But, you know, when you look at this, even if you're not clued into plants and meadows and you're not a big meadow fan, it's pretty obvious that it's supposed to be there. You can also do it by shape, if it's a square or a circle or something that people can read the design in it. You can do it by your plant selection, by massing and doing drifts of plants. Here we have a couple of different kinds of sedges and some trees, but you see the flow, you see the design. It's pretty clear that those didn't just happen that way. You can take your cue from existing natural landscapes and just uh, distill them down. This is not a rain garden, but it makes my point. This is Mount Cuba Center. These are all native plants you would find in any Piedmont woods. But what they've done is they have grouped them. And they have intentionally placed them so your eye sees here's the low ones, and here's the next level, and here's our tall structural trees. And you can do this at any scale. I mean, you can do this in a small garden with just larger perennials. They can be your structural element. Here again, what they did was they kind of thinned out the forest and limbed it up so that you got this cathedral idea. But you see very, you know, we are tuned, you know, by evolution to look for patterns. So when we see patterns, we're like, okay, I know what that is. I'm comfortable. It's not like chaos everywhere. All right, so in your packet are some designs. Um, there are others you can get. I just pulled these as examples to give you an idea of the range. Uh, we have tall, full sun, perennials. We have a mix here of shrubs, tall shrubs, small shrubs. Perennials, again, full sun. We have a corner, which I think, you know, looking in some of your neighborhoods, a lot of you might find a useful idea. <coughs> this is 150 square feet, this particular design. So it's half, again, what our minimum is. A lot of these are, are bigger, but you can get the same idea, just do it smaller. This one, and you see we also have shade ones part shade. This is a change. You know, we started rain gardens in Prince George's County in the 90s. And once upon a time, 
people thought they had to be in full sun. They thought we needed to get that evaporation along with the infiltration. We, we now know that's not true. So shade is fine. This R, R says full sun on it, but yours says part shade. They have both versions okay. on this website. Right, thank you. Um, and the link to the website is on the back of your guidelines. Thank you. Um, but my point here is not so much to give you these particular sites or patterns, but to give you the idea that there is the range. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing that is, again, difficult about communicating this to people who don't garden is when I say shade as a gardener, if I say partial shade, I'm talking about less than six full hours of sunlight, right? That's what we consider a full sun. You know, full shade, we're talking maybe three hours or less of full sun, and the rest of the time is dabbled through the leaves. But people that don't garden hear you say shade, and they're like, oh, cool, I can put it in that corner back behind the garage where there's no sunlight whatsoever. You know, obviously that's not true. There has to be enough sun for, for plant matter to grow. It has to photosynthesize. But with that exception, yes, you can plant in the shade. And it is fine to, to speak to your question to have a rain garden with a tree canopy. The only thing that you need to be careful about is that you don't want to damage your lovely trees. Right? And because remember, we, unless you have it naturally, you have to have that ponding area. Now, depending on the lay of your land, sometimes you can do that by not cutting down as much as sort of berming up on one side if you, if you already have a bit of a slope. And then you could do less actual excavation. Um, but what Debbie was talking about is we don't want you to put in your rain garden and then go, oh crap, I killed my tree. <laughs> so with that proviso, um, a lot of us were, grew up learning that trees have big roots that go down. And they, they do have roots like that structurally to hold them in the ground. But all of their feeder roots go way out and they're like in the top three to 12 inches and they go way beyond the drip line. So you do need to be mindful of that. And this design is also in there just to show that if you want to have a formal design, you can have a formal design. You don't have to have Carol's Wild Crazy Meadow with all the dragonflies if that's not your thing. Okay, um, you guys are being really patient and sitting, and I'm gonna try and breeze through here, but I wanna give you a little bit of a primer on all these things. Rain garden plants. Okay, we said natives. Why? They give us all these benefits. They support the food web. They bring the birds and butterflies to your yard. Uh, less water. Once they are established, you're pretty much good to go. Um, and they match your garden conditions. Right? You're trying to grow some white birch from the northeast it's too hot here in the summer. So what are you gonna do, run out and put ice on its roots in the summer? You know, it's much better to pick the plants that like what you have rather than try to change what you have to match the plants you wanna grow. And the way we do that most easily is with natives. And my favorite reason is they provide a wonderful sense of place. Right, if I see this, I know I'm somewhere in the Sonoran Desert. If I see this, I know I'm somewhere in California or Oregon with the big trees and the sword ferns. If I see this, I'm really lucky I'm on vacation. <laughs> and if I see this sweet bay magnolia and pitcher plants, I know I'm in a magnolia bog, an ecosystem that has only ever existed in Prince George's County, the district, and a little bit of northern Virginia. That's here. That's home. Where can I see a magnolia? Uh, you can go to Suitland Bog and once a month or so. Um, I forget the ranger's name. Check with Maryland National Park. Park yeah, and go, go on the park and planning, and they do have walks. I recommend it. It's fabulous. So yeah, where is this house? Mm -hmm. Right? Is it Alaska? Is it Texas? Is it summer? Is it winter? I don't. Well, there's there's chairs on the porch. Maybe it's summer. Maybe if they had a pumpkin, I think it was. You know, Halloween, I don't know. 
just a couple of quick plants. Debbie brought the book format. Um, this is also searchable online, and you Ma have the link in your I think, he, I think you can only get it online and download it now. Yeah. Um, so here are a few, just a, not just good rain garden plants, but easy peasy <coughs> plants that I happen to love. Right, the blue false indigo, absolutely beautiful. Cardinal flower, which is also hummingbird candy. <laughs> This is a great one to know, especially if those of you who have shade. This is a wet shade uh, ground cover. It'll spread and it has, it's uh, evergreen. And then in the April you get these lovely flowers. And the leaves are kind of cool too because they're purple on the back. Just a couple, just to whet your appetite. Okay, maintenance. Well, the maintenance is really pretty similar to a regular garden. Assuming that everything's working, your inflow is coming in, right? When we're getting water into the rain garden, it's not gouging anything out because it's too concentrated. When you have a big storm, you have a way for the extra water to go. If all that's working, then all your maintenance is is regular garden maintenance, right? Weeding, right? We all have to weed. Water rate when you first plant until the plants get established. I'm going to throw one thing in there. When you do weed, weed carefully so that you don't mistake that native plant that you want there for the non-native. If you're not familiar, go ahead and flag your garden so that you know what's going on. And if you do have a native that suddenly appears in a clump that it's not supposed to, that may be a native, but it may also be a weed because it's beginning to outcompete. Take it up. You may not want to throw it away, but you want it out of there. This is where a lot, a lot of gardens go wrong. It's because people don't know. I've seen gardens where they pulled out all the plants that were planted and left the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> no, literally, I have. Um, and sometimes you see ones um, where, you know, invasives have come in. You know, a weed is a plant out of place, so it's in the eye of the beholder. But there are some plants, invasives, those that damage ecosystems that we don't want. And if you got some of those take over your rain garden, they'll actually make your ponding area disappear. We have a little maintenance schedule in there, so we won't talk anymore about that. That's it.